F. Pastor of the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, 2186 Hawkins Mill Road, Memphis, Tennessee, 38127, in the Fraser community. New Salem is a growing church for growing people going all out for God. So if you are one uh, who desires to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, we recommend New Salem. If you're one who wants to be busy for the Lord, active uh, in ministry, uh, we invite you to New Salem Missionary Baptist Church. Again, we thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us at this uh, noon hour for our Sunday school Bible slash Bible study lesson. Uh, we're here every Thursday at 12 noon. Uh, I do want to take a moment to remind you that as of Sunday, this coming Sunday, we are back in the building. Amen. New Salem will be back in the building. Uh, we thank God for the opportunity to serve him. Amen. In every way possible. The Lord has been by our side up and had not been for him. We don't know where we will be, but it's time to get back into the building and serve the Lord. Now, that being said, we do realize that the pandemic is still going on. Some of you have had shots. Some have not had shots. Some will take shots. Some won't take shots. Some have been infected uh, and self-inoculated uh, and various things are going on. So, again, we do understand and respect your disposition as it relates to live worship services. But on Sunday, for those who care to come in and to the altar and have a prayer moment before service start and then maybe depart because you don't want to be part of worship uh, at this yet at this point in time, our altar will be open at 1030 for individual altar prayer. Uh, we will begin our service worship services at 11 o'clock. We will have face masks. Uh, we will be as socially distant as possible. We, we will be taking temperatures and doing everything else. Uh, that we can possibly do. Our building has been professionally sanitized and, and, and we will continue to do so, amen, until this pandemic is over. So those who do come in to join us, we do want you to feel safe. Uh, all right, we will be there from 11 to 12 uh, and about 10 minutes to 12 or at noon, right? Somewhere in that time frame, we will be doing communion. Uh, communion will be available for those who have sat through worship it will also be available outside for those who desire to come take communion. Amen. Again, we do respect and understand your desire and disposition for those who choose not to come into live worship. If you choose to bypass the worship and come for communion, it will be available at 12 noon in the parking lot. Uh, we do thank God for each of you. Again, even though we're live, we will continue to broadcast um, on stream through on Facebook from 11 to 12 be uploaded to YouTube shortly thereafter. For the time being, we will continue our Thursday Bible study stream at noon. Uh, and of course, as soon as we finish here, it will be uploaded on YouTube. Again, we invite you to come fellowship with us because New Salem is a growing church for growing people. And if you have a desire to grow, amen, beyond uh, where you are today uh, in Christ, we invite you to come join New Salem. Again, I'm not saying New Church Salem is a perfect church. But I would say that it is a great church. Amen. God bless your heart. We thank God for this lesson today. We have a good lesson for us in the general subject. February 7th is called Called to Testify. Called to Testify. Again, we're in unit three of this one a quarter. Um, deal with the call of women. Amen. And I, I, I went to great lengths to uh, help you understand where women fit in the ministry of Jesus Christ in the work. And I didn't say preaching, I said in the ministry. Ministry is more than preaching uh, in the word of Jesus Christ. But uh, there is a great controversy as to what offices women have been called to. And I went to great lengths yet last week to give you my understanding as the Holy Spirit has revealed to me. Uh, and uh, I was told by the Holy Spirit to stick to my lane. My lane is to preach and teach. Amen. Uh, anyone else who's, who is calling people from the streets to Christ, amen, is, is a welcome co-worker. Amen. And God will do the separating in the end. Again, I can't say that all men are called to preach that are preaching. Amen. So uh, God used a donkey and he used various other things, amen, to demonstrate. And so, again, God is God. He's sovereign. He does not need my permission. Amen. To do what he chooses to do. My thing is to say, yes, Lord, and make sure that I'm doing what he called me to do. God bless your heart. It's time for the church to stop majoring in minors and minoring in majors. The scriptures say we gag it. We gag it nets and swallow camels. Amen. So let us begin. Continue the work 
amen, of getting souls saved. And after all the souls saved are saved or the majority of the souls are saved, then we can sit back and talk about some of the less essential things that are going on in this world. And so we're dealing with the call of women. And today we'll, the subject is called Call to Testify. We're in the gospel according to St. John, the synoptic gospel of St. John, chapter 4, verses 25 through 42. The synoptic gospel of St. John, I'm sorry, the supplemental gospel of St. John, not synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic. John is supplemental coming behind. Amen. Giving a greater clarity and understanding those synoptic gospels, which shows this covers the same text, the same portion of the life of Jesus Christ, but from different perspectives to different audiences. God bless your heart. Today in John 4, we're dealing with what the, the text um, commonly not called the woman at the wells. Amen. Jesus is now in the city, in the region of Sychar. Amen. And traveling and he comes up to, he comes to Jacob well. Amen. They've had a long journey and they're hungry, especially his disciples and his disciples go into the city. Amen. To, 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 to find some food. Amen. And as Jesus at the well, he encounters a woman that is there. Amen. Drawing out water. Uh, and this woman happens to be a Samaritan. Amen. And then Jesus began to reveal to this Samaritan. Amen. Some water that she never expected to get. Amen. She came for the physical water and she met the living water. How blessed that is. Amen. To be searching for one thing and Je allow Jesus to take you to a higher level. And so we're in John chapter 4, verses 25 through 42. As we start the introduction, uh, it's important to understand the context, uh, the nature of the relationship between Jews and Samaritans, uh, which, 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 which adds to the complexity of this story. Uh, after the death of King Solomon, Israel was became a divided nation, uh, separated into the northern and southern kingdom. You had two two, two tribes, Judah uh, and Benjamin, to the south, and you had the other tribes that were to the north. Of course, uh, remember the tribe of, um, oh goodness, the tribe of Levi did not have land, amen, as they worked, they worked in the temple, amen. And they were uh, a, a, a separate, separate nations in Israel, the northern kingdom, amen. Uh, the king set up the city of Samaria. Remember, Jerusalem was part of the southern kingdom in Judea. So they had their temple and they had the city of David and Bethlehem, all in the southern kingdom. So in the northern kingdom, uh, Samaria was established as a city and the center for worship. And they set up a, a, a alternate temple, amen, in Samaria to be able to worship God. Uh, but uh, the king, uh, especially Ahab, the second king, um, were brought anger to God because they followed idolatry. They did not cling to the to the to the knowledge and the ways of the true and living God. And God became angry and he sent prophets and, and they warned the northern kingdom. Uh hear the word of the Lord and they refused time and time again. So after a while God allowed Assyria uh to come and destroy the northern kingdom. And most of the Israelites in 722 BC, they were exiled, but they did leave a few Israelites behind in the land. Also, they brought in outsiders to resettle the land. And uh, over time, some of the Jews that were there began to intermix with the outsiders that were there. And the resulting race or a group of people called Samaritans, amen, because the, 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 the worship center was the city of Samaria. Uh, now, when it came to the Samaritans, they were not were hated by the Jews because they were not Jewish, uh, but they were not considered Gentile. As it relates to the, their faith, uh, the Samaritans accepted the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. Those are the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But the rest of the Old Testament, amen, they had no part of. So remember, when you come to the prophets in the history, uh, Old Testament uh, history, history, and those historical books, remember, they were not accepted. They only accepted the books of Moses. So in the Samaritans' mind, Moses was it. They didn't deal with King David and Solomon and all those all those all those other the later prophets. Amen. Uh, also, when the temple in Jerusalem was ultimately destroyed, they offered to help, but they were not allowed to help rebuild the temple because they were considered half breeds. This angered them. And then later on, the, the Judean, Judean king actually destroyed the temple that was in Samaria. Amen. And, and that led to great animosity between the Jews and the Jews and Samaritans. They had absolutely no dealings whatsoever. Amen. There were no dealing between Jews and Samaritans. Uh, and also, adding to it, there were no de dealings in either race. 
publicly between men and women. Amen. So again, is Jesus going to encounter a Samaritan? And then she's a woman. That's that's a double jeopardy in today's lesson. Now, this woman he finds at Jacob's well. Uh, he meets her. Uh, and he's alone because the disciples have now departed to go find food in the city. Uh, and when he meets this woman, he begins to talk to her and tell her about all the adultery and fornication in her life, about the husband and the man that she's with now, not even her own husband. As he began to have bulge things about her personal life after just meeting her, the woman becomes amazed because this man knows everything about her life. And she begins to understand uh, that uh, he is not, he, he's more than just a regular man. He's more than a priest. Amen. She refers him as a prophet. And then he, he continues to teach. As he continues to teach, the conversation then goes from uh, her life actually worship true worship and she wants to tell jesus where her people go and worship and where his people worship but jesus bypasses um the basis of that conversation and he begins to teach her what true worship is amen remember the record says that god is a, is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth amen that's you familiar, familiar with that scripture and so watch this he teaches her that true worship is not based on a sight but it's based on the sincerity. You are, 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 are you with me? It's not based on the location you worship, but it's based on the worship in your heart. So it's not sight based, it's sincerity based. Uh, John records in John 4, 23 to 24, he says, but the hour Jesus tells her right before our text, he says the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Again, that has great impact as it relates to the day, because again, it's not about a building or denomination. Amen. It's about the the spirit in your heart. And that's what John the Baptist taught when he was when he was saying, uh, make the path straight. Amen. The path he was talking about was the path of your heart, because we must worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Again, and so Jesus is not at the well. And he has revealed certain things to this woman, and this woman has come to understand and believe that Jesus is no ordinary man because he's able to reveal to her things uh, that she actually thought were actually thought were secrets. And she noticed that even as Jesus deals with her on these things, he is not belittling her. He's not talking down to her. He's not ostracizing her. He's not trying to make her feel less than. But again, he speaks to her with hope. Amen. Uh, to let her know that God has not rejected her, that God is still waiting. Amen. With open arms. And as we begin to evangelize, we have to learn to stop talking down to people. Uh, the Bible is not a baseball bat with spikes to beat beat people in the head. Amen. The Bible, the Bible is a it is God's cloth designed to wrap us in His loving arms. Let us know that He cares about us no matter what, and that salvation is free and it's available to anyone who believes. Amen. Our job is to not make people feel less than. Amen. Because we're always saying, "But for the grace of God, there go I." All of us are ex-somethings, amen, and we encourage something that we just haven't told anybody about. Somebody say, ouch. I said, all of us are ex-somethings, and we encourage somethings that we don't want anybody to know about. Amen, somebody. That, that's praise news. Amen. But God still loves us in spite of ourselves. God bless you. We in, uh, again, we're in the book of St. John, Gospel according to St. John, verse 24 through 4. 25 through 42. And again, for those who don't know, uh, these notes to accompany this, this, this lesson as I teach, they are found on my Facebook page. They're found on the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church Facebook page. And again, many of you have requested that I begin to send you these notes. Um, and so I have a list that I, I send them to on, the, on your phones and I send some uh, through Messenger on Facebook. And if you desire that I send you these notes again uh, in that way, uh, just inbox me or text me or something, and I will find a way to get those to you. And so that's the background. As we end this lesson, Jesus has just finished telling this woman about worship. And he says, God is a spirit, and they, they worship him, must worship him in spirit and truth. And verse 24, uh, 25, and the woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. 
when he is come, he will tell us all things. Amen. So she sees Jesus as a prophet, but she still thinks there's one coming greater than Jesus who's able to even tell more than Jesus. Amen. And so now watch this. Jews and the Samaritans both are waiting on the Messiah. The Messiah of Christ simply means anointed one, anointed one, the one anointed by God to come and carry out the work of the plan of salvation. And so both of them are waiting. Amen. But they're waiting from different perspectives. Now watch this. The Jews have the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament. Amen. From Genesis to Malachi. So they got prophets, they got history, they got poetry, they got law, they got everything, right? They understand the heritage as, as it ties back to King David. And they have, they always pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. And so based on David being the king, the Jews are looking for a Messiah that is political, that is coming to restore the throne of King David. Amen. To put the Romans and everybody else out of power so the Jews can take rightful possession, amen, their own heritage, their own destiny, all right? Now, the Samaritans only accept the first five books of the Bible, Pentateuch, amen, the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So they don't have the David stuff, the prophet, the prophetical stuff, and all that stuff, amen. So they're looking for a teaching prophet on the order of Moses, because Moses is their prophet. In Deuteronomy 18, uh, verses 15 through 18, Moses records, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Uh, unto him ye shall hearken according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in horror in the days of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken uh, that which they have spoken, and I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now remember when Israel was at the foot of Mount Sinai and they didn't want to use Moses anymore. They said let God speak straight to us and God began to rumble the mountain and the fire began to shake and they said oh no God, 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 God you hold your peace and let us continue to hear through Moses. And so he said in after Moses, I'm going to raise up another prophet like Moses. So that is a prophet, the teaching prophet that Samaritans look for. Again, so now the Jews are looking for a political Messiah. The Samaritans are looking for a spiritual Messiah. And so she said, we're looking for one uh, in 25, and when he has come, he will teach, tell us all things. In other words, Jesus, I realize you know a whole lot. Amen. But there's a bigger prophet coming than you. So you jump down to verse 26 and look what, look what Jesus said. Jesus said unto her, I did speak unto thee, I'm he. Get that? So she says, I'm, I, 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 you're saying something that's intriguing me. You're saying something that makes me know you're not a normal man. I need a normal prophet. Uh, and I'm in love with what you're saying, but I know greater is coming. And Jesus, uh, rather than dealing with the conflict of the Messiah that the Jews are looking for versus the conflict that the Samaritans are looking for, he goes straight to the point. And he says, it's not about the conflict, it is about me, because I'm the one that both of you are looking for. Amen. Now, what does that have to say today? That says today that we denominations and churches need to stop fighting each other. Because Jesus, I'm not dealing with your conflict. I'm dealing with the similarities. Amen. Now, watch what similarity? Jew, the Jews and Samaritans were both waiting on the Messiah. And they both agreed that the Messiah was coming. Amen. And so that's similarity. And any church that believed Jesus Christ hung, bled, and died on Calvary's cross, on the third day he rose, he rose for our salvation, and he's coming again. Any church that's teaching and preaching that, amen, is doing a great work. Are you with me? All of the other stuff that we fight about is irrelevant. So Jesus bypasses all that stuff, and he says, I'm the one you're waiting to meet. Amen. And based on what he's already demonstrated, amen, she calls him a prophet. Amen. Now watch this. Jesus has demonstrated enough in all of our lives 
that we shouldn't be fussing, arguing, and fighting over nitpicking stuff. Again, the record says we're swallowing camels and gagging on gnats. We're majoring in minors and minoring in majors. It's time to stop that kind of stuff because that's what has the world confused. Amen. While the church fiddling, while the church fiddles, Satan has the world on fire. Amen. And so it's time for us to put down our fiddles. Amen. And, and start building people's faith in Jesus Christ. All the other stuff we're arguing over does not have any salvational significance. Amen, Reverend Smith. 20. Uh, so he, he affirmed to her. He said that if you get past all the stuff y'all fighting over, you can see me. That's how I say verse 26. If you can get past the Jew Samaritan conflict, you may be see me. And some of us, if we can get past the, the religious conflicts that we have based on our denominations, amen, we'll be able to see Jesus more clearly. Watch this in verse 27. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou? Why talkest thou with her? Now watch this. Disciples have been gone. Food. And they come back in on the tail end of the situation. Remember the tail end? They were on the tail end of the situation when they when they woke, woke in Gethsemane. And Jesus had already been arrested. They were supposed to be watching while he prayed. They were on the tail end of the conversation on Mount Transfiguration. When he took Peter, James, and John, they fell asleep. Amen. And when Moses and Elijah appeared, they caught the tail end. And Peter said, let us build three tabernacles, one to Moses, Elijah, and one to the Lord. They had missed the whole conversation. That's why God got upset and said, this is my beloved son, he, he, him. He took away Moses and Elijah. Moses represented the prophets. I mean, the, the law. Uh, Elijah represented the prophets. So Jesus said that ignore what Mo, ignore Moses and Elijah and hear only my son Jesus because he's a fulfillment and the, the summation of everything that Moses and Elijah said. He's fulfillment of all law and of all prophecy. Amen, somebody. And so now they come in here on the tail end. And they see Jesus talking to this woman. Now, again, a Jew talking to a Samaritan, as I told you, was out of order traditionally. A man talking to a woman publicly is out of order traditionally. And so here Jesus is, unmarried Jesus, a Jew, talking to this unmarried or whatever you want to call her woman who's Samaritan. That could be double, triple, or quadruple indemnity. And so they all got questions, but nobody asked a question. Now, if you want to know something about Jesus, ask him. You're right there with him. The scripture says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. He's right there with you. Why not just ask him? But the disciples see the, see the Lord, and they don't ask a question. Now, remember this. The only stupid question is one you don't ask. But they are afraid to ask Jesus. What they want to know. Now, of all the people in the universe, you should be afraid to ask something. Jesus should not be on that list. He said in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. He invites you to ask. Amen. Because the only way you can ensure and secure understanding is to ask questions. Amen. If a teacher is teaching a lesson to a class and nobody ever asks questions, that teacher can be sure that nobody's learning anything. You all missed that. If a teacher is teaching a class and nobody asks a single question, that teacher can be sure that nobody's learning anything. Hello, somebody. All right. Let's go to verse 28. Now, the woman be is asking question, but his own disciples are standing there like dummies. 28. The woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to me, now watch this. Because the woman was conversing with the Lord, her status, her situation, and her priorities changed. Because the disciples never asked and engaged in what was going on, they're still in the same place with the same mindset. Uh-oh. I'm going to teach now. The problem is that too many of us go to church just like those disciples. 
We'll sit there like we know everything and won't ask anything and we'll leave with the same mind we came. They went away from Jesus hungry, looking for food. They came back to Jesus with food. Now all their mind is on is food. They're stuck on food. And then we understand with ourselves, our problem with church is that we go there the same way all the time. We're complaining about the serve the preacher didn't preach, the choir didn't sing. It wasn't really we didn't have we didn't have a really good day. Why? Because you went stuck on stupid and wouldn't get off of it. Amen, somebody. But now watch this woman. Watch her. She left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, now watch this. The woman left in such a hurry, she didn't take what she brought. Oh, my goodness. I got to teach for 20. Y'all just give me a minute here. She came to the well with what she thought she needed. To get what she thought she needed. But when she met Jesus, she realized that what she came for was not what she needed. And since she didn't need that water, the water pot became a burden. Hold on now. Don't leave me yet. She brought a water pot thinking it was an asset. But when she talked to Jesus, the water pot became the weight of sin, which does so easily beset us that Paul talks about. And so now I'm going to drop my water pot and run to go tell somebody what I know now. So she hurriedly left and she left what she brought, but she took what she got from Jesus because she realized what she brought to the well did not compare with what she got from the water. I'm teaching this thing now. Are, 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 are you all with me? And what she got from Jesus was more important than tradition. It was more important than cultural norms. It was even more important than her own personal shame because this woman who had been embarrassed, who had been hiding, and all the other things because they had talked about her, her lifestyle, she goes back now and she's talking to the men. Watch this. Because Jesus is a barrier breaker. She puts away her shame. She says, forget these cuts norms. She says, I've got something that's bigger than tradition. Now, cultural norms say I ought to keep it to myself because I'm a woman, and then I, then I got a bad reputation. But watch this. She said, I got it, and I got to tell it no matter what. No matter what. Just like John and Alabama's ex exile because of preaching gospel. She said, I got to tell what the Lord gave me. I can keep it to myself. And you all know I'm going to go to Jeremiah. He said, for, in, in 28 and 9, he said, But since I spake, I cried out and I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord had made me a reproach unto me and the reason daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor will I speak any more on his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bone and I was weary with forbid for forbearing that I could not stay. So I said I wasn't going to tell nobody but I just can't keep it to myself. How the Lord is blessing me. Oh, can't you see? I got a story to tell you. Once I left, I, I, I left home with my head down. I left home with tears in my eyes. I left home broken hearted, ashamed, abused, misused, mistrusted, broken, disgusted. But I went to the well with, the, with, with my water pot. And I met, a name, I met a man by the name of Jesus. And since I've been touched by the master, my life has never, has not been the same. I came back running with my head up and left my water pot because I found out that water wouldn't do me no good. But he gave me some living water. He said it'll spring up like uh, in my bowels like everlasting life. And if I drink of this water, I'll never die. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. So she hurried and left what she brought because what she brought weighed her down. She filled up that water pot. She went back humped over and leaned over. And most of us leave worship humped over and leaned over because we busy carrying them big old water pots. Some that is, some that is, of, is of no value. But she left her water pot at the altar. You all hear me? She laid her burden down. And when she laid her burden down, her feet got light. 
her soul got happy and she began to feel all right and she went running amen somebody to tell others about the goodness of the Lord. I, 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 are, you, are you all here with me i discovered that the reason most church folk don't like talking about don't talk about jesus because they don't know nothing good about him to say you know they say if you can't say nothing good about somebody don't say nothing that's why most of us don't talk about jesus you can't say nothing good about him. somebody say ouch <laughs> the quickest way to end a phone conversation is to start talking about Jesus. Oh my goodness. Verse 29. I got to get out of here, y'all. Verse 29. And look what she said. She said that she went to the men. Now again, she's not supposed to talk to men in public according to tradition. But she went to the men. Despite her reputation. Despite what folk might say, despite what people might think, she said this message I've got from the Lord, amen, is bigger than my burdens. Watch this, watch this. So she went, 49, she went to the men, said, come see a man. She went to the men to tell them about a man, which told me all things I had ever did. Is this not the Christ? Now look what she does. Look what she does. She had a personal testimony, first of all, that Jesus was a man, but he was no ordinary man. And then she concludes from the evidence that she's seen that he must be Christ. In other words, based on what this man did, that I'm an eyewitness of, nobody can do it because he got to be the Christ. And so she, in the form of a question, she challenges the men to come see for themselves. In other words, you all got a whole lot of reason to believe me. I'm a woman. I'm a Samaritan. I take, I sleep with other women's husbands. I lie, I cheat, I steal. In other words, I'm not asking you all to believe me by yourself. All I'm saying is that based on what I see, you ought to come check it out yourself. Amen. I know my mouth ain't no prayer book. I know my life is not a gospel. But 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 based on what I'm telling you now, you all need to come see for yourself. In other words, she extended the invitation. Amen. Watch this. Luke 14:23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go into the highways and hedges and compel men to come in. My house may be full. See, we've got to stop what I call, what's called passive evangelism. Let people make up their own mind. Watch this. Sin, can I give you this? Sin will never make up its mind to do right. Because sin does not have the right, does not have the mind to do right. So you can't wait for sin to make up its mind. You can't wait for a sinner to make up his mind. We are supposed to be their conscious until they have a conscience. And so he says, compare men, make a man. So what? Folk don't mind making you mad. When them folk out there on the street begging, you ask you for money. You care, you think they care about how many other folk can ask you that? Well, they ain't gonna ask me to come check up. Folk ask them all the time, and they part time. But them dudes on the corner don't mind asking you for quarters. They don't care how many folk ask you for a quarter. One dude asks you for a quarter, and, and, and the other cat see you giving him a quarter. And he'll come right back and ask, since you give it, hey, since you give our quarters, give me one. So why are we so different? He says, compel men in the hedges. What are the hedges? The hedges are those places you don't want to be seen in. Y'all miss me? Go in the liquor store and get them out. Go in the crack house and get them out. Go in the house of every people and get them out. Because they're not coming out on their own. He said, go and compel them to come out. What does compel mean? Compel mean you, you've got to present them a case. A personal case. Amen. In order to bring out, you got to get their attention. Are you all here with me? Verse 30. Verse 30, verse 30, verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came to him. Now, wait a minute, y'all. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This woman was disrespectful. This woman carried no respect in the community. Every low-down title you can think of, this woman had in the community. Are you are you all with me? She was a fornicator, 
adulterer. That could be a liar. <laughs> that goes with it. But this woman, in repute, she went to the men. They know she's not necessarily an honest woman. But yet her testimony came across as something that could not be ignored. And so we got to be stop being scared of what you used to be. I don't care if it was yesterday. If you were a mass murderer yesterday and you met Jesus last night, you ought to tell somebody today. Somebody help me say hallelujah. Did you all get what I said? If you were a mass murderer yesterday and you met the Lord last night, don't be scared to tell somebody today. Look at what I gave you in your notes. Her Christian report outshined her carnal reputation. Did you all get that? Her Christian report outshined her carnal reputation. The reason Shane keeps so many folk from testifying is because they think the testimony is about them. And it's not. Your testimony is not about you, not to make you look good. John 12, 32, the Lord said, and if I be lifted up on the earth, I'll draw on men unto me. Does not matter who put the bill in your mailbox, it's got to be paid. Does not matter who put the check in your mailbox, it's worth cashing. Y'all don't hear me today. And so we got to remember that our testimony is not about us. My testimony is not to prove who I am, it's to prove who he is. I'm about to shout, y'all. But we got too many folk testifying trying to prove who they are. Now stop testifying and stop preaching and stop praying and singing to prove who you are, but you must do it to prove who he is. That's a testimony. You all, you all hear me? Because that's the only message that will stand the test. That's why it's a testimony. Ain't no testimony for me because I will lie. Y'all miss that. I'm a fallible human being. I'm capable of lying. Which means if you check me through and through, something ain't going to meet the test. But if you check Jesus through and through, word for word, everything about him meets the test. Why? Because there is no failure in God. Which means no matter how you turn him or lift him or twist him or move him, he always passes the test because there is no failure. Y'all hear me? And so if it ain't about Jesus, not a testimony. Huh? So they heard her. Her testimony outspoke her lifestyle. And based on what she said, the men went out of the city and came to Jesus. Amen. What did I say? Her Christian report outshined her carnal reputation because her testimony was not about her, it's about Jesus. Verse 31 says this. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. Hmm. Watch this. The woman came with a water pot to get water. Met Jesus, dropped the pot that she brought with no water in it. And she left with a testimony. She didn't leave like she came. Are you with me? The disciples, on the other hand, came with food. Didn't converse with Jesus. And they still stuck on food. They remained like they came. Are you with me? The woman who was a sinner <clears throat> didn't leave like she came. <clears throat> but the disciples remained the same as they came. Why? Because they didn't see any need to change. And the reason we don't get any better is because we think we're okay like we are. 
And so I'm going to get Jesus some bread. And if I feed Jesus some bread, then I ought to be okay with Jesus. He ought to look past me because I'm going to feed him. And most of us come, go to the altar, altar the orphan tray, amen, and give $2 and think those $2 are going to wash away our sins. And you stand it with your offering because you ought to be tithing. Ouch, somebody. Somebody say, ouch. I said you sin in the offering because you ought to be tithing. Huh? You know God killed the man and the woman at the offering table, don't you? You for y'all find that scripture and, and, and come back and tell him. I'm not even, even give you the name. I'm not even give you the name. But he sold what he had and lied. And Peter said, Why lie to the Holy Ghost? They killed him. God killed him. Then his wife came back and did the same thing. He killed her too. Are, are, are you all here with me? But watch this. The disciples said, Master. Now, on your notes, I got two comments. They had a Martha mentality. What is a Martha mentality? When Jesus in that house, Mary washed set of Jesus' feet and listened to his teaching. And she washed his feet with her hair. And Martha in the kitchen complained, said, y'all be having me cook. And Jesus set Martha out, telling her that Mary had chose the better part by sitting in my feet listening to me. Uh-huh. And then I said they had an Esau action. Esau for some food, for some red stew, some pottage, sold his birthright to his brother for a bite of food. Amen. And so we find now in this text, these apostles, these disciples, missing the message because they're stuck on food. And how many times have you sat in church? Rather than hearing the message from the altar, you sit there wondering what you're going to eat for them. You wondering how crowded shuttles are, or how crowded Friday is going to be when you get out. You want the preacher to cut his sermon short because if he don't hurry up, the restaurant going to be crowded. Popeye's going to be out of chicken. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. The disciples were focused on food and felt like the food was the most important thing. That's why whenever a church has a program and they have some food, you'll find folk who show up that'll never come any other time. The day you had the food, it just happened to be our work. I'm through. I'm through with that because somebody mad. Verse 32. But he said unto them, they offer Jesus some food. But he said to them in verse 32, I have meat that you know not of. And they don't know not of it. He said, because the natural man cannot understand the things of God. Because they're foolish to him. Now to the, to the disciples, it's foolish to have another conversation when they stomach growling. So he says, I got meat you know, and meat refers to food in general. He says, y'all stuck on that bread and bologna. Them sardines y'all got. Whatever you got, in the, in, in, whatever you got, got with that, that, to go with that bread, that food you finna eat. He said, but I'm already full. He don't even understand it. And they don't understand it because at that moment, being hungry, the disciples were operating in the physical plane. But Jesus, based on his conversation, was operating in the spiritual plane. Now, watch this. This is what caused conflict in the church. Because during worship, some folks are operating spiritually and some folks are operating physically. That's why one person shouting and other folks looking at them. You all miss. But see, they are, but see, they had access to hear the same thing the shouter heard. But the shouter took it spiritually. And they took it carnally. 
So it reached the shout of spirit and it didn't do nothing to the common person. So the shout is not shouting and other person sitting there watching. Spirit and flesh don't get along, right? That's why there's a wall in the church building. And so since the disciples were operating carnally, they couldn't understand the food Jesus was talking about. In John 14, Jesus said unto her, if thou knowest the gift of God, who it is that said to thee, give me the drink. Thou would have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. Living water. That will never let you die. In John 6, 48, he says, I am the bread of life. Your father did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. See that bread of disciples, you're going to let them die. But this bread which comes to you coming down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. That's what they, Jesus and the woman just had. And in 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. But the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Y'all, are, are you all still there? In other words, and, I, and so I got all this living water, got all this living bread, and y'all talking about some wonder bread and some baloney. Hello, somebody. In verse 33, therefore said his, the disciples one to another, had any man brought him to eat? Now, this shows you they stuck finally. Because they said, mm, somebody, else, somebody must have fed Jesus already. They still think he's talking about physical food. But they ask each other, Jesus standing right there. Why do we go to folk before we go to the Lord? So rather than ask Jesus what he was talking about, they choose to stay stuck on stupid. Even though Solomon said, lean not to thy own understanding. Solomon also said, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Jesus right there. Y'all won't ask him nothing. Why are you asking me and Jesus standing right there? See, you know what? Stop letting folk ask you about other folk business. Somebody in the choir singing. Somebody next to you ask somebody, and you it's so and so, so and so, so and pregnant. Go up there and ask them. Why are you asking me? And ain't right there. See, that's how mess gets started. We get caught up in mess, letting folk ask us questions to attach our name to something. See, if I ask you if Lala pregnant, I sue sue hug her. Even you say you don't know. I'm gonna say you told it. I'm gonna use you as a witness when I tell when I tell the night to somebody else. So tell folk, stop asking me about them. Go ask them when she get through singing. Put your finger up like folk do in church. Put your finger up and stoop down and tip up to the choir stand and say, and say, Sue, Sue, are you pregnant by La La Hub? And if you don't get slapped at the choir stand, to God be the glory. I'll leave that there. They said to one another, had any man brought him, any man brought him food again, they're still stuck on stupid. Look at verse 34. Jesus said unto them, he, he hears them. He will hear how faint is crying. That's a bad bad. He hear their thoughts, their questions. And so he said to them, in, in case y'all want to know it, but won't ask me, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. In other words, I don't have time for these, these stupid conversations. I got work to do. He says in one place, I must work the work of him that sent me while it's day for night coming when no man can work. I got I, I, I got a deadline to finish his work. Are you all with me in John 5, 36? He said the Father sent me to do a work greater than John the Baptist. Watch this. So Jesus said, the Father's business is food for his soul. The disciples saw food for their belly. Why Jesus fed the woman faith. Are you with me? Now what's in your belly won't help nobody. But what's in your faith will help anybody. Did you all get that? What's in your belly won't help nobody. But what's in your faith will help anybody. And so while they sought to feed their bellies, 
Jesus was feeding her faith and they were not even aware of it. Because faith reaches faith. Are you, are, are you all with me? So she left better. They're still with Jesus. The woman is gone. But she's better off than they are. Ain't that something? And I hate to say it, but there are some folk outside the church building that's better off than some of them folk in the church building. Because we just sit in the building, not paying attention. We just like the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. We sitting in front of Jesus, sleep. I'm going to get you out of here. Verse 35, he says, Say ye not, there are four months, then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up eyes and look for the fields for they are white already with harvest watch this with Jesus saying now they, they were fishermen but they were also farmers they, and they all knew that traditionally about four months or 12 weeks after you plant a crop you're ready for harvest most things most vegetables grow in about 12 weeks give or take give or take give or take and so the farmer plants they have in their mind in four weeks is harvest time. So they got four weeks to do something else. But Jesus said when it comes to, to the harvest of souls, there is no time. He says because according to his missionary work, he says now is harvest time. Evangelism simply means harvesting souls for God. The fields of harvest are is the world. Jesus is more likely referring to them people who are coming out to see him now. Remember when the woman went to testify? The men came back running, all came to see him. Jesus pointed it over for He said, that's the harvest. He says, white the harvest. What does white mean? Well, seeds come up green or whatever color, but when they when they, they being enlightened when they when when, when 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 they're ripe. And so white means it's fully ready. And so he says this green crop is now fully ready to fully ready to be harvested. And there is no time to waste. Go with me quick to a garden where you got tomatoes and watermelons and peaches and all that stuff growing. If you don't collect when everything is in full bouquet or full bloom and the wind blows through that June breeze, oh, it smells so beautiful. You begin to get the scent of the watermelons, the scent of the tomatoes, everything. Oh, it's a beautiful smell. But let that stuff stay in the field and start dropping to the ground. It becomes the worst smell that you can imagine. Can't nothing stand it but a hog. It's time now to send the hogs in there to eat it up. Because those good smelling peaches are stinking. Those good smelling watermelons are stinking. Those good smelling tomatoes now stink. And the problem with the world is the world now stinks. Because we've let the harvest rot in the field. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. That's why the hogs are running loose in our society. They're acting just like hogs. Amen, somebody. Running loose in our society because we allow the crop to rot in the field. Hello, somebody. So, Jesus, what are you waiting on? Because white now is a harvest. You all sitting up here eating, talking about bologna and sausage and hooked cheese. But you ought to be doing what the woman did. The woman left, dropped her water pot. Why can't you all drop these cheese and crackers? You all here with me? You all who are with me ought to be going from me to do what this woman did. But y'all going to sit down and talk about her. Well, you know, she likes other women husbands and all don't talk about all this other stuff while y'all sitting out there eating y'all crackers. You baloney. But you ought to be out in the world doing what she is doing. In verse 36, the Lord said, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and he that gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Now watch this. Everybody got a particular job to do. In those days, you had two groups. The laborers, they would go out and till the soil, break the ground, they fertilize it, they sow the sow seeds, they water the seeds, and they go back and cut chop the weeds. But at harvest time, there was a different group came coming. And they would go in and cut the sheaves, bundle the sheaves, take the corn and wheat and whatever, thresh it and one of the grain to separate it, get, get it ready, get it ready to be in, in silo. Two different groups. 
But guess what? Evangelism is the same way. There goes a sowing and a reaping. Are you with me? Just because you preach a sermon, somebody joined the church, there had to be some work done before they came to hear your sermon. Tell on somebody. Who brought them to church? Who told them about salvation in the beginning? So watch this. The preacher can't stick his chest out because somebody came to Christ. You didn't preach to Christ. Somebody had been sowing seeds along the way. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. Folk didn't just, the woman didn't just start shouting because you were singing. It was something in the woman already. So stop talking about who you made shout. You ain't, uh-uh. It's not about us. It's about him. And so somebody sold and somebody reaped. And what's the goal? To fill the silos of heaven. What is the of heaven? The silos are the mansions. The room, Jesus, in my father's house are many mansions. He said, compare them to my house may be full. Gather the crop. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. Paul says, I have planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase. So watch this. You, ain't, you can't grow no church. You can't grow a ministry. You just stay in your lane. The farmer can't make nothing grow. With all the watering and wheat, all that's another, uh -huh. it ain't the fertilizer. God don't step in, nothing can grow because all life comes from him. Now watch this. He said if this works right, in the end, everybody gets paid. Watch this. It's been four months since the laborers tilled the soil and sowed the seeds and water them and cut the weeds back. They've been waiting for four months. Now the laborers come in and they cut the grain, all that stuff. And they got to wait a little while until everything is sold or divided. So watch this. Some had to wait longer than the other. But in the end, everybody's to pay. He said, when you come to my field, I, at the end of the day, I'll pay you what's right. Whatever time you came in. Paul says in Galatians 6, 7, he says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For so ever man sow, that shall he also reap. For he that sow to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sow to the spirit shall of the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not be weary in well doing for a new season you shall reap if you faint not. Don't go out there and grow the crop because you ain't got paid in three months. Go out there and kill and, 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 and tear the field up. Uh-uh. Get the harvest of the chance. Get the crop a chance to finish growing. Get the harvest of the time to come in. And after a while, everybody's going to get paid. You know how much you're going to make. Whatever God says is right. I'm got, I got to get out of here. Verse 37. Verse 37. Herein is the saying true. One soweth and another reap. Now watch this. Reaping today requires work yesterday. If you didn't do nothing yesterday, guess what? You need to go into the field today. But despite that ignorance, the disciples were facing a rapidly approaching harvest. And they sitting back acting like they don't know what's going on. And we're doing the same thing. We sit back, act like we know the harvest is white. And guess what? The result of it is the crop has rotted in the streets. And we're living through rotten stuff right now. That's why there's so much rotten stuff happening in our world. Because we let the crop rot. You got Matthew 9, 6, 36 through 38. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going there, but you, but, but you got that because we, uh, because we, we're headed into evangelism, but we're getting ready to uh, come up to the Great Commission. And Jesus said to them, I send you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you were in, into their labors. Guess what? So watch this. Um, how much teaching did our parents do that we allowed to rot in the field? If we had just been as faithful as mama and daddy, as faithful as grandmama and granddaddy, the world wouldn't be in the shape it's in. But we sat back and let the field, let the stuff ride the field, thinking it's somebody else's job. I don't want to be no farmer no more. Well, you got to eat, ain't you? Guess what? Doesn't matter how long you go to school, somebody got to grow some food. 
Oh my goodness, y'all y'all missed that. And so watch this. Since we didn't nobody ever sold anything, nothing is being reaped. But that which was sold, we simply let it right in the field. Ain't that a shame? Watch this. I, I, I know I got to go. But how many times have you saw where older folk kept up a property in a house? Didn't have what they kept it up. But they died left, left it to the children. And now it's so raggedy, you can't believe the old folks stayed there. Now, they had to work to pay for it and kept it nice. They left it to their children and their children did owe a dime on it and let it go to seed. It happens all the time. We let stuff right in the field. Verse 39. And many Samaritans of that city believed on him. For the saying of the woman, which testified. And he told me all things they ever did. Faith leads to faith. And testimony leading to faith is a central theme of the gospel. John 1, 7, the same came to bear witness of light of all men that they might believe. And the works of Jesus, he did those works as a testimony. John closes his ribs saying these things he did that many might believe on his name. The woman accepted Jesus and created faith in her. Her testimony created faith in other folks. The result was that many believed on him. Why? Because true faith, get this, is contagious faith. Get this now. Don't get nothing else. True faith is contagious faith. It's more contagious than Corona. It's more contagious than measles, but it spreads the same way. They say you spread Corona through breathing on folk. Well, if we begin to breathe out the word of God on some folk, <laughs> they'll catch it. If you got the measles, if you touch somebody, they'll get sick. That's why he said, well, two or three come up touching the green. We got, and guess what? He left the church to infect the world. You with me? The church ought to infect the whole world with Christianity. And we do have the power because true faith is contagious. I'm running now. Verse 40 says this. So when the Samaritans came, would come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And, abide, and he abode in three days. Watch this. Again, Christianity, because of faith, overtakes culture. It broke down barriers. Because Jews. Samaritans would not ask a Jew to stay with him. But these men asked Jesus to visit them. Revelation say, Behold, I stand door knocking men and hear my voice. I open the door. I will come in and sup with them. In other words, Jesus don't want to just die in and out. He wants to come and sit down at your table. Amen. And take time to teach you something. And this brief encounter with Jesus was undeniably powerful. The woman wasn't there long. Amen. Amen. But watch this. I found out as a child, it does not take long to start a fire. You all miss me. It does not take long to start a fire. But it's hard to put one out. Some of y'all who had a hay bale on fire know what I'm talking about. Finally, you find 42 through 41 and 42. And many believe because of his own word and said unto the woman, now we believe because of thy saying. For we have heard ourselves and know this is indeed Christ saved the world. Now watch this. And I'll make this quick. Some of them believe based on the woman's testimony alone. But people are different. Just like Doubt and Thomas, it takes more for some people. They need their first-hand experience. You find Doubt and Thomas in John 20, 25. He said, I got to see for myself. Somebody see for themselves. But in this lesson, we see the escalation of the understanding of the person of Jesus. When the woman saw Jesus, she thought he was just a man. Then, a little closer, she saw he was a Jew. A little closer, she thought he might have been a, she, she saw he was a devout man. A little closer, she saw he was a prophet. A little closer, a prophet escalated to Messiah. And now, in this closing verse, he's called Savior of the world. In other words, when she learned more about Jesus, she saw his ministry was bigger than her. His ministry was bigger than the disciples. His ministry was bigger than the Jews. His ministry was bigger than even the Samaritans. Why? Because Jesus came to save the whole world. John says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
And whosoever believed on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says this, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. That's how big his ministry is. Now, I close with this question for you. How big is your God? Does your God only specialize in you? Does your God only specialize in your family? Does your God only specialize in your problems? Does he only specialize in your situation? Or is your God the God of all who can do anything but fail? Is your God the creator of the universe? Creator of all things? How big is your God? God bless you. This is Rev. Again, this is Rev. J.W. Smith, Pastor of New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, 2186 Hawkins Mill Road, Memphis, Tennessee, a growing church for growing people going all out for God. Again, our door will be open this Sunday. Amen. All private altar prayer, 1030 to 11, worship 11 to 12, and then inside and outside communion will uh, shortly at 12 o'clock. Amen. If you don't want to come for worship because of the pandemic, we understand uh, and we appreciate your position. You can come for prayer and leave, or you can come at the end and just receive communion. Amen. We're there to meet the needs of all people at all levels. That is the God we serve. We thank you. We appreciate you. We hope you've been helped and blessed. May the Lord keep you. Amen.